Thai word for intelligence, satipanya, is a combination of two Pali terms, sati, mindfulness, panya, discernment. In other words, the ability to keep things in mind and to know what you should be keeping in mind, and to watch for distinctions, to understand things, to see what's a cause and what's an effect, what causes are connected to which effects and which ones are not connected to any effects, or which ones are not connected to each other. This you have to see for yourself. Traditionally, they talk about three ways of fostering discernment. One is through listening or reading. One is through thinking. The other is through developing, which you actually try to develop good qualities in mind. You use your mindfulness to keep in mind what you've learned, and in trying to apply it, you develop a different order of discernment. This is where practice takes the stuff you've studied, but also takes you to an entirely different level. It's possible to read books and then not do anything with the knowledge, but that's not what the knowledge is meant for. It's meant to be put to use to bring about true happiness. And if you don't put it to use in that way, that's a sign of lack of intelligence right there. You can also see it as a lack of honesty. I mean, if, who doesn't want happiness? Yet you study about these things, then you leave it there. So you really do want to put this into practice, and that's when you actually learn a lot more. It's through making an effort that the discernment develops. Of course, that's right effort. We can learn about right effort. There are four kinds of right effort. There's the effort to prevent unskillful things from arising in the mind. And if unskillful things have arisen in the mind, then you try to abandon them. As for skillful things, if they're not there yet, you try to give rise to them. And if they are there, you try to maintain them and bring them to the culmination of their development. That's four different types of effort right there. And it's not just making the effort. You also have to motivate yourself. And again, we can talk about different ways of motivating you to practice. When you think about all the suffering that you're going to undergo if you don't practice, and the suffering you're going to cause for other people. Think about how fortunate you are you have this opportunity to practice, so don't throw it away. There are lots of different ways of motivating you. Basically come down to the principle of heedfulness. Realizing that you're doing things all the time, so you might as well do them skillfully, because if you don't do them skillfully, you're going to do them unskillfully. It's not a matter of choice. You can't say, well, I'm just not going to engage in anything at all. You're constantly making these choices, so you might as well do them skillfully. Do them with care. We can talk about these things, but how you actually use them in your practice, that's something you have to learn for yourself by practicing, by making the effort. I can sit up here and talk about all kinds of different ways of motivating you to practice, and, but it's up to you to, to realize which ones are going to work for you and which ones are not. And if the ones you've read about or heard about, the methods for motivating yourself that you've read about or heard about don't seem to work, what are you going to do to motivate yourself? Because there are a lot of things on the path. They give good results, but you don't like doing them. They're hard. So that's one of the first lessons you learn, how to motivate yourself. And then when we talk about those four kinds of effort, which ones are the most appropriate ones to apply right now? And they're part of a larger pattern where the Buddha talks about the duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths. Essentially, what's talked about in right effort of the duties with regard to the cause of suffering and the duties with regard to the path. But the further duties, trying to comprehend suffering. In other words, you look at it, 
try to figure out where in any situation is the suffering right now, where is the stress right now. What kind of stress is it? Is it the kind of stress that's just there, or is it stress that you've been adding unnecessarily? And if you've been adding it, why? What's pushing you to do that, and how can you f figure out the reasons for why you make suffering, and how can you figure out how to undo those reasons? In other words, develop a sense of dispassion for them. Because there are things that you like and the things that you crave, and in, in going for them, you create suffering and stress for yourself, you suffer, suffering and stress for other people. And for most of us, we've learned how to ignore that, to turn a blind eye the stress and suffering because we want the other things so much. So as you look at your practice, you're sitting here right now meditating, we're trying to develop the path. If you've got some mindfulness, how do you keep it going? If you've got some concentration, how do you keep it going? I can give you advice on that, but the real discernment comes when you figure out how to do it for yourself, how to read the situation and figure out what kind of effort is needed right now. And of course there's the issue of how much effort, how much strength do you have right now. A lot of the members of this community have been, have been laid low by flu and colds and whatnot. When you're sick, what's the appropriate amount of effort? How much effort can you put into the practice? What expectations should you have? When you're feeling well, when you're feeling healthy, how much more effort is appropriate? And there's also the issue of the particular issues coming up in your mind. Some of them require only that you look at them and they'll go away. It's because of these that a lot of people think, well, that's all there is to the meditation. Just look at what comes and it'll go, and that's the end of the problem. But there are a lot of issues in life that don't just go away, a lot of issues in the mind, things that are causing you stress and suffering, and you can look and look and look, and they're not going to go away. That's when you have to dig down deeper to see where the mind is lying to itself, telling itself it's not doing anything at all, and yet somehow there's, for some reason there's a suffering and stress coming up, and who knows why it's there. It's not my fault. Well, look right into that. That's when you have to dig deeper, when you have to exercise your ingenuity, exercise your abilities to watch carefully, to learn how to read the mind when it's telling you the truth and when it's covering up things. This issue of just right covers all kinds of areas in the practice, everything from how much sleep is enough, how much sleep is too enough. <clears throat> Excuse me, too much, how much sleep is not enough. The same with food. How much is too much, how much is too little, how much is just right? How do you learn how to read yourself that way? When you listen, you can hear that these are issues that you want to look at, but what you're actually going to see and actually how you negotiate what you see, that's where you develop your own discernment. And finally, as you're sitting here watching yourself practice, where is the extra stress? What can you do to avoid it? This applies not only to blatant stress, but also to the stress of the path itself. In bringing the mind to concentration, observing the precepts, developing all the different factors of the path. This requires effort, and it's going to require some stress. So how do you figure out which stress that you're experiencing right now is a an essential part of the path, and how much of it is an unnecessary burden you've added on top of yourself. And it's in looking at those extra burdens that you begin to see various types of craving that hover around the path. We know that there are certain levels of craving that are going to be necessary to stay on the path, but you've got to learn how to separate things out, see which parts are necessary and which parts are not. For example, as you observe the precepts, it is necessary to get very strict with yourself and develop a real sense of shame and compunction around any mistakes you might make in terms of the precepts. And as you practice, you'll begin to realize that you're starting to apply the same standards to other people, so, you get, so it's hard to look at anybody who's misbehaving. 
Now, it turns out that's an unnecessary part of the path, but for certain stages it's a necessary spillover. If you don't develop a strong sense of shame or a strong sense of distaste for actions that go against the precepts, it's going to be very easy to justify to yourself that, well, I'll be a little bit looser here, and after all, it's all about the middle way, right? And the question about moderation and observing the precepts. The precepts themselves already describe a moderate way of life, a moderate path of practice. And so you want to be strict in adhering to them so you can stay right there in the moderate spot. Where things start going overboard is when you start really getting down on other people. You look at other people and all you can see are their mistakes. Now that ultimately is something you want to learn how to let go. In the meantime, you develop the discernment that comes with telling yourself, for instance, that you're not going to tell a lie and trying to stick with that, and then realizing there are situations where you don't want to tell the truth because it's going to harm somebody. Okay, how do you avoid saying that thing without lying? It's when you take the precepts seriously that you develop more discernment, more ingenuity. The same applies to your concentration. And go through the day and say, well, I'm mindful as I can be. But if you decide to be really, really on top of things, okay, how do you stay on top of things without getting all on edge, without driving yourself crazy and people around you crazy? How are you very strict in your mindfulness and yet able to act in a natural way? These are skills that require discernment. They're, they're going to develop your discernment, because it's all about learning to watch yourself, see what you're doing, see what the consequences are, and realize where you're adding unnecessary stress and how you can let it go. We can talk about these things. You can read about them. One of the reasons why the Buddha had to establish this pattern of apprenticeship is that you can be around a teacher who can watch you as well. But ultimately, you've got to do most of the watching. The teacher can't watch you all day. And after all, you've got to develop your own discernment there, your own sense of responsibility, because otherwise the path just doesn't work. So these are some of the ways in which discernment does get developed by putting forth or trying to put forth right effort putting forth whatever effort you can and then making it right. That's how discernment grows, and that's how it actually achieves its purpose, which is to bring about two happiness. And it's the most intelligent use of your mental capabilities. So try to keep that point in mind. <laughs>